Yeah, thank you, Camilo, for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to uh, talk in the seminar. It's a pleasure. So uh, this is uh, this is work which uh, 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 Michael Goldman, who is now at uh, uh, CNRS in Paris, who was postdoc in Leipzig, uh, and I started a while ago, uh, a couple of years ago, and then later on uh, Martin Hussmann, uh, who's in Münster now, and Tatsuya Miura, who uh, is in Tokyo, was postdoc in Leipzig too, uh, uh, joined in. And uh, some of these, uh, are we, essentially all I'm talking about, you can find on the archive. This will take a while till it's, it's accepted, but till it will appear. So it's, um, it's a variational approach to, uh, to the regularity theory for the mont jean equation, or rather a variational approach to uh, the regularity theory for optimal transportation. And before I explain uh, and remind you what optimal transportation is, I, on the next slide, I just want to uh, uh, tell you on one slide, let's say uh, more or less for, the, uh, for those who already know a little bit the story, what, uh, what this talk will be, uh, will be about. So, uh, so essentially the main idea or the main message is that when it comes to the uh, regularity theory for the mont jean equation or for optimal transportation, one can pretty much follow uh, the philosophy of uh, De Georgi uh, uh, for the regularity of minimal surfaces. And uh, uh, one element I will particular focus on is what's called the harmonic approximation which uh, plays a key role in the regularity theory for minimal surfaces, and which also plays a role for our variational approach to the regularity of uh, mont jean -Pierre. And then once with, equipped with this, uh, with this one crucial element, the harmonic approximation, uh, then there is more or less uh, ubiquitous uh, machinery uh, by which uh, uh, you can go to what's called a one-step improvement lemma, which in the language of minimal surfaces improves flatness, which feeds into what's called a Campanato iteration, uh, which gives you what is called epsilon regularity. I will explain what it is in a second, and uh, eventually partial regularity at least. So, uh, so the main message of what I'm going to talk about today is that this, uh, uh, this uh, approach, this general approach, and in particular the first step uh, 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 translates from uh, the famous theory of minimal surfaces to, uh, uh, to the regularity theory for the mont jean equation. And what will come out is a certain type of Schauder theory for the uh, um, potential of the, uh, uh, for the solution of the mont jean equation, which is the potential and optimal transportation. I'll explain that in a, in a second. And again, so the main message is that uh, we can, uh, we can uh, have a kind of a purely variational approach. So approach which uses uh, kind of just elements from the calculus of variations will never appeal to maximum principle and in that sense, we avoid uh, Caffarelli's famous theory, which I will mention a bit more in a second. And so what, what, what can be, so I think this is intrinsically interesting, but uh, what can be done uh, uh, with this um, is that we're able to reprove some of recent uh, 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 famous results like partial regularity for the mont jean equation a nice paper by Guido De Filippis and Alessio Figali based on earlier work by Figali and Kim. We can kind of imp slightly improve uh, uh, the existing boundary regularity theory for optimal transportation. And, but then we, I think we can also do kind of rather new things like uh, giving a more fluctuations based, a more microscopic analysis of the optimal matching problem between uh, the Poisson point process and the Lebec measure, which connects to, uh, uh, to recent work of uh, uh, the PISA school. So that's, uh, that's uh, on one slide uh, for uh, those who know a little bit the subject, uh, what, this, uh, what this talk will be about. And now I'll slow down and uh, remind uh, uh, 
those of you who are not that familiar with optimal transportation and the Mangin pair equation, what this is. And please, I don't know whether questions are possible. Of course, I'm happy to take to take questions if that's possible in this technology. Of course, they are definitely possible. So people can unmute themselves and ask questions directly, or they can write a question on the chat, and I will actually uh, then okay. interrupt you and, and ask you the, the related question. Okay, great. So please do. So here is uh, one slide, uh, the first slide on, uh, on optimal transportation, which uh, you know, has been and still is quite popular in, uh, in analysis. So in a certain sense, it's, uh, 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 you're given two uh, measures which have the same mass, uh, 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 mu and uh, mu, sorry, mu and lambda. And, uh, and the goal is to transport uh, the mass, which you th should think of being made out of little particles, uh, uh, into the other mass by transporting every particle uh, from the left to the right, and to try to do that in a somewhat optimal way. And uh, the kind of softest way of formulating that uh, variational problem is due to Kantorovic and makes use of what's called transfer plans or transference plans. So those are measures on the product space, on the space of uh, uh, the x's crossed with y's, uh, which has the property that the first marginal uh, of that measure on the product space is given by mu, and the second marginal is given by lambda. So that's just a description that you take everything which is on the left-hand side and you put, uh, you fill up everything which is on the right-hand side. And now comes the optimal, uh, the variational aspect of it. You want to do it in such a way that you minimize the squared distance between the place where you took the particle and the place where you put the particle. So that's the Euclidean distance x minus y squared and then you integrate that against the transference plan. And uh, optimal transportation means to solve this, uh, uh, this variation problem, which uh, is uh, solvable by uh, soft methods. I mean, this is a completely convex uh, variation problem. And, uh, um, and the minimum of, uh, the, uh, of that variation problem in a certain sense, is a distance, a square distance in the sense that the square root would satisfy triangle inequality between the two measures, which sometimes called as Rubenstein, Kantorovic, Wasserstein, I like to call it Wasserstein distance because that's a nice name, nice sounding name. And uh, 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 that's, uh, that's kind of, that comes with, uh, with, uh, with optimal transportation. And uh, it's uh, kind of also quite popular in statistics or in, in probability theory, because it's a way of coupling uh, two random variables in such a way that you maximize the uh, uh, covariance. So it has, I mean, it comes up in several areas. Okay, so that's, uh, that's uh, in a nutshell, on one slide, optimal transportation. So what's the connection to the marge on pair equation? So very roughly speaking, the Marjan pair equation is the Euler Lagrange equation of optimal transportation. So, here again is the, uh, is the problem of optimal transportation. Here I simplified for uh, the sake of conciseness a little bit by having the target measure to be the Lebesgue measure. So, again, we're minimizing the, uh, uh, the squared Euclidean distance over all transport plans, which, uh, which have these two marginals. And then it's a, a kind of a soft outcome of uh, uh, convex analysis that the support of this measure on the product space of the pi of the optimal plan, of the optimal plan or an optimal plan is cyclically monotone. And uh, that's of course uh, equivalent to saying that the support is contained in the uh, subgradient of a convex function psi. That's the uh, Kantorovich potential in, uh, in the sense so uh, you will know that uh, 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 convex functions uh, uh, always have a notion, even if they're not regular, a notion of gradient, which is set valued. And that's, uh, that's the way to see. 
but then um, then if you uh, uh, if you uh, uh, are a bit bolder, you can say, well, a convex function is in particular Lipschitz, at least locally. So we have a gradient by Rademacher, a gradient that's defined almost everywhere. So let's look at this. And then if you look at this and spell out what the marginal condition means, you realize that uh, for any test function zeta, uh, the integral of zeta composed with the gradient of psi against mu is equal to the Lebesgue integral of zeta. And now if you use kind of a change of variables, uh, you realize that, uh, and the kind of fundamental theorem of the calculus variations, because you have an arbitrary test function, you realize that this amounts to the following partial differential equation, at least in the smooth case, namely that the determinant of the derivative matrix of this, which is the Hessian of the potential, is equal to the measure mu. And that's, uh, that's an instance of the, uh, the margin pair equation. Uh, uh, and I'm going to say a little bit more about the, uh, the nature of the, uh, the margin pair equation on the next slide. So here again is the, uh, is the margin pair equation. We have a convex function psi. We look at the determinant of its uh, second derivative matrix, its Hessian. And let's assume that the right-hand side is as simple as it can be, equal to one. Then uh, this falls, now this is a bit of language, this falls into the class of uh, what's called fully nonlinear equations with a kind of a nonlinearity, a map which goes from symmetric matrices into the real numbers, which is given by the determinant minus one. It's uh, elliptic in the sense that if two matrices are ordered in the sense of positive, uh, positive definiteness, uh, uh, then uh, you have an ordering of uh, this nonlinearity, which means that the margin pair equation satisfies a comparison principle. So that's good. So it's in a certain sense an elliptic, uh, elliptic equation. However, the ellipticity is degenerate and uh, which can be easily seen by linearizing the equation. And the degeneracy is kind of comes hand in hand, or if you want, is counterbalanced by a very large invariance group. It's an affine invariant equation. So it has a kind of a non-compact uh, uh, um, invariance group, uh, which of course uh, should be contrasted to uh, uh, the Laplace equation, where you don't look at the determinant, but the trace, uh, which is rotationally invariant, so it has a compact symmetry group. And now there was kind of a series of uh, uh, great papers by Luis Caffarelli, uh, who kind of uh, got the initial and most important regularity or conditional regularity theory for the margin pair equation, just by building on these two elements, the comparison principle, the affine invariance, and uh, kind of very geometrically minded compactness argument. So, uh, so in a certain sense, that makes the margin pair equation so interesting and so important because it's at the crossroads of two uh, types of nonlinear PDE. I mean, the, all the theory of fully nonlinear PDE on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's, but it's also a variational problem because as I explained, it arises uh, as the Euler-Lagrange equation of, in optimal transportation. And, uh, and in this talk, I will focus on this, uh, on this variational side. So why is, why, why is regularity theory for this equation interesting? Uh, because it's, uh, it's a nonlinear equation, uh, which has the property as interesting nonlinear equations do have often or occasionally, uh, namely that smooth data don't guarantee a smooth solution. And uh, the, uh, uh, the example, there is a kind of an easy, uh, a very intuitive example by, by Caffarelli, uh, where he looks at uh, kind of an initial density mu and a target density lambda, which roughly speaking have this shape. So uh, mu is a characteristic function of a ball. And, uh, and lambda is almost like the characteristic function of two balls 
I mean, the ball cut into half and the two sides removed, uh, then it's obvious in this extreme case that the optimal transportation would have to be discontinuous, the map uh, which uh, pushes forward the measure mu into the measure lambda. But the point of Caffarelli is that even if you kind of smooth out this by putting a little, little neck here and smoothing out the corners, this uh, non-smoothness persists. And even if you move away from characteristic functions and you kind of smooth out the density, that would still persist. And there are more subtle counterexamples in the Riemannian setting by Grigois Leupa. So because of this basic fact that we cannot, under all circumstances, under every circ under, uh, circumstance, expect regularity, what is called epsilon regularity is interest. And uh, so the notion of epsilon regularity is something generic in regularity theory that's used in many... Uh, many instances and essentially it means that if somehow some the right non-dimensional quantity is locally small then you're in the smooth regime in the sense that uh, that uh, smoothness of the data transfers to the smoothness of the solution and here of course the natural question is i mean let's assume that locally your transportation is not so far, can you then argue, can you then show that, uh, that you have an epsilon regularity result in the sense that kind of smooth data imply a smooth solution? And, uh, uh, and that's indeed true. That's the uh, 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 result of uh, De Filippis and Figali. And uh, uh, here I want to kind of tell you about a different proof of this result, which uh, goes via harmonic approximation and kind of uh, calculus variations. So harmonic approximation in our context means the following. Uh, it means uh, uh, that uh, provided kind of the same type of smallness holds. So if your localized transportation cost falls below a universal threshold, then the closeness of the densities to the constant densities implies that the displacement is close to the gradient of a harmonic function. So this quantity here should be thought of the displacement. That's kind of the, uh, uh, the um, uh, optimal coupling. And y minus x is exactly kind of the vector by which you push your mass. So that's the, uh, that's the displacement. And the statement is, and I'm going to give you the rigorous statement in a second or on the next slide, that the displacement is in this situation close to the gradient of a harmonic function. And that's the, that once you have this result, kind of uh, the more general theory of, uh, of uh, uh, elliptic regularity theory kicks in and you can derive the epsilon regularity from there. So what I want to do now on the next slide, uh, if there are no questions, is to give you a precise statement on this, uh, of this harmonic approximation result. Okay, so here it is. So that's really at the core of the analysis. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so again, the, the philosophy is uh, provided uh, a key quantity uh, is below a certain threshold, then kind of the, uh, 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 the smallness of the data tell you that uh, uh, your displacement is close to the harmonic rate. So, uh, so the, local, uh, the local quantity which has to be low a certain threshold is the local energy, the local transportation energy. And I use the name E like energy. And it looks at the transportation cost, but localized in a, in a ball of a radius of the order of one. And here I take six because in the end, the result goes down to one. That's people in regularity theory know this type of phenomenon that uh, it's a local regularity result. So you have to give up, uh, you have to stay away from the boundary uh, of where you control things. So that's the, uh, uh, that's the local energy. And then there is a, a, a local data size term or squared data size term. So we want to measure 
how far our arbitrary measure mu, which might be very irregular, kind of think of it as a Dirac measure, a bunch of Dirac measures, how close that is to the uniform distribution. And, um, and so, uh, uh, so the intrinsic, the natural way to measure that is to take the, uh, the Wasserstein distance, of course, the, uh, which is in a certain sense the right, uh, the right way to measure that closeness to, uh, uh, to the uh, uniform density. And so kappa, uh, we have to be more flexible than just allowing kappa to be equal to one. Uh, so we also measure the distance from kappa to one. And we do the same thing for the target measure, not just the initial measure mu, but also the target measure lambda. And now here comes the statement. So um, uh, for, uh, for any tall, uh, which you should think of as being a small number. There exists a threshold, which is universal in the sense that it just depends on tau and the dimension, and some constant, which is universal in that sense too. So that provided uh, you're sufficiently short uh, transported, uh, so provided E and D are below this, this threshold epsilon, then there exists a harmonic gradient which is controlled in the natural way. And this is, but this here is the uh, more interesting line in the sense that the, uh, uh, the displacement, so y minus x, so the way the amount you shifted your, uh, your mass, uh, so from x to y, is close to, uh, locally close to the gradient of this harmonic function. And of course, what's on the right-hand side is also important. So this quantity, which is of the same type as the original energy. Now, th since you subtracted the harmonic gradient is just a small fraction of that quantity. So, uh, so this, in a certain sense, renormalized transportation distance. So this transportation distance modulo the harmonic gradient is just a fraction of the original transportation energy plus kind of a big portion of your data term. So that's the uh, that's kind of in a, in a in a in a nutshell, or that's the statement of the uh, of the harmonic approximation argument uh, statement. And now I want to uh, uh, discuss this a little bit. And uh, uh, sorry, yes. Felix. So sorry. you call it you, you call it an harmonic gradient. Uh, so, but that's so that map phi. Yes. Is actually vector valued, or am I wrong? So, so phi is phi is scalar. Is scalar? Red phi, phi is phi is scalar, and red phi is a vector. And that but then I'm slightly confused by oh, you're computing it on one half x plus one half y. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, that's where you so, compute it. Okay. Right. I mean, I I can compute it at x, uh -huh. or I can compute it at y. Right. Okay. I'm sure. Sure. Way. Sure. I understand. So that's just a choice. As, as, okay. Thanks. Yeah. That's a that's a choice. So uh, so phi is. Phi is almost a harmonic function, but that's, mm -hmm. that would be asking too much. Uh, so, uh, uh, and I will tell you how to construct phi in a second. Mm -hmm. But here the important thing is that at, at least it, it's, it's, its partial derivatives are harmonic. Mm -hmm. This is what, uh, 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 what, I'm, what I'm trying to say. Can you say a word about uh, C times D, which looks, uh, C is large here, so that that's, that, well, that's, uh, not a problem. I mean, so, tau so times e is, tau is arbitrarily small, but c is some very large yes. constant. Yes. So, so, so in fact, this result is even interesting. And, and if I have the time, when I tell you about the proof, uh, even if d is equal to zero, which means that the measures are locally constant, then this term is not there. And that even th in this situation, the result is interesting. So, but now, of course, uh, will need it in this, uh, in this more general form. And, uh, but this is, so this is um, kind of not uncommon in, uh, in modern approaches to Schauder theory that uh, 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 in a certain sense, what you want to do is you want to go down in scales and you want to show that uh, the, the, the energy on a smaller scale can be controlled by just a little bit of the energy on the larger scale, but possibly a large chunk of the data term. So it's the so energy, the, fact, the key is so the energy. Sorry? 
The key is to control the energy. The key is, so that, that has to be, in order to kind of feed this into a campanato, what's called a campanato iteration, it's important that the tau is small and you don't care for the fact that the C in fact becomes large as tau becomes small. Okay, thank you. Question? Okay, so, uh, uh, so now I want to kind of comment a little bit on this, on this proposition. So it will also appear on the next slide. And then I, will, I want to tell you how, to actually, how you actually get this, um, uh, this harmonic function or this harmonic gradient to be more precise. So, uh, so here again uh, is, is the statement. So, uh, so w one element which I want to point out because that kind of sets this approach to regularity a little bit apart from the other one is that in a certain sense, this estimate has the correct homogeneities because everything is quadratic in the displacement. The energy is something that's quadratic in the displacement. The Wasserstein distance, the squared Wasserstein distance is something that's quadratic. And uh, the Dirichlet integral is something that's quadratic in the gradient. So everything has the right homogeneity in the sense that we're not uh, kind of uh, uh, comparing uh, uh, apples and pears, but uh, uh, these these quantities have the right uh, the right homogeneity in the solution. So it's a linear-looking estimate for a nonlinear equation. And the second thing I want to point out, which essentially I already did before, is that all the topologies are natural. So we look at the local energy. After all, we're solving uh, the variational problem with the energy. We're measuring the size of the right-hand side and the right metric, which belongs to optimal transportation. That's the Wasserstein distance. And again, when we kind of, uh, when it comes to the left-hand side, we're looking at the natural L2 type, uh, L2 type quantities. So, uh, so the homogeneities are correct, are matching, and the metric is also matching. So very much like as you, if, if you were looking at kind of a, a nicely uniformly elliptic, but kind of nonlinear elliptic, uh, more standard elliptic problem. Okay, now I, I owe you uh, an explanation of uh, uh, how to get this harmonic gradient. And uh, in fact, in order to do so, uh, I have to change a little bit the perspective on optimal transportation. Uh, and that's something which is uh, a kind of beautiful observation by uh, Jean-David Benamou and Yann Brunier, and which is kind of uh, folklore by now in optimal transportation, namely that there is a more fluid, a more Eulerian uh, way of uh, thinking about optimal transportation. So uh, in a certain sense, so far, uh, uh, I've introduced the, uh, uh, the, what you might call the Lagrangian side of optimal transportation. Uh, here is a rendering of these two measures, initial and target measure, and the uh, kind of optimal, uh, uh, the support of the optimal pi. And, but in principle, rather than looking at this picture, you should think of this as, as, as the, you should think of this coupling as defining trajectories which uh, kind of transport or which connect the initial and the terminal density and thereby also kind of lead to inter interpolated densities that sometimes called McCann's interpolation and which can be seen as arising from a flux J uh, or a velocity field uh, J divided by rho. So, uh, so that's a completely equivalent way of looking upon optimal transportation, not on this Lagrangian side, but on this Eulerian side, where instead of looking at transfer plans, at transport plans, you look at couples of densities and fluxes, rho and j's, that satisfy the continuity equation, the usual continuity equation we know from mechanics, rational mechanics, and which minimize what you may assimilate, at least in the mathematical form, to the kinetic energy, one over rho j squared. And in fact, uh, and that was the observation by Benamou Brenier, 
the uh, Wasserstein distance, the squared Wasserstein distance can be equivalently characterized as minimizing the kinetic energy over all pairs of densities and fluxes that satisfy the continuity equation and that connect the initial to the target density. So that's the, uh, that's the, Eulerian, uh, that's the Eulerian approach uh, formulation of optimal transportation. So what's the advantage here? Um, so one thing you see, you didn't see when at least I couldn't see in the original formulation is that now some strict convexity of the variational problem appears because this integrand here is, is a strict convex function, jointly convex functional rho and j. And of course, uh, if we want to use a variational approach uh, to regularity, it should build somehow on strict convexity. And, uh, and another thing which you see is now also the linearization. One easy way to look on the linearization, if you drop it, kind of if you pass to the harmonic version of this uh, functional here, then you see that the Wasserstein distance is replaced by, well, the electrostatic energy uh, or in a functional analytic language, the H minus one norm of the difference of the densities. And for those people who know about minimal surfaces, it's a certain sense going from a very full description to a current description. Okay, so I did tell you this because now equipped with this different interpretation of optimal transportation, I can tell you how to uh, define the, how to get this harmonic gradient. And um, uh, well, I mean, so that's one slide, still one slide ahead. So here I've just reformulated the previous proposition uh, now completely on the Eulerian side. So, uh, uh, so now I should think about the local energy E to be a kind of locally integrated uh, uh, kinetic energy. And uh, the statement runs, uh, runs as follows. If this uh, Eulerian emanation of the local energy plus the data term is small, then there exists a harmonic gradient in such a way that the flux can be approximated by rho times red phi, which I could also express by saying, uh, uh, this shows that one can approximate the Eulerian velocity, which is rho divided by j by harmonic gradient. So we're approximating Eulerian velocities by harmonic gradient. Okay, so that's, that was just uh, essentially one-to-one -one translation of the harmonic approximation result to, uh, uh, from the Lagrangian to the Eulerian setting. But now I did that because I can now tell you uh, how to choose this harmonic function. And probably you already guessed it uh, by solving a Neumann, a flux boundary data problem. So, uh, so here again is, is kind of a, schematical rendering of the Eulerian formulation of optimal transportation. We have the continuity equation. We have the data at uh, bottom and top. And now we restrict to some ball of size BR, which of course has a boundary. And then there is a flux flowing across the boundary. And, uh, and that we have to accommodate somehow. So F is the normal component of the flux J and F bar is supposed to denote the time average, that's the T axis, the time average of this flux. And now it's not so surprising what this harmonic function, where it should come from, or the harmonic gradient. Uh, you solve the, uh, uh, you look at the harmonic function up to constant, which has these flux boundary data, or these Neumann boundary data. So, uh, uh, so, uh, and since they don't integrate up to zero, you have to allow for a constant. That's the reason why we just get a harmonic gradient instead of uh, uh, getting really harmonic function. And the, and, and the idea of the pick, I mean, the idea of, uh, of the approximation is really, um, is really encapsulated in this picture. So on the upper hand, we have the optimal transportation problem. So the nonlinear variation problem and on the lower side, we have the linear problem, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Poisson equation with Neumann boundary data. 
And, uh, uh, and the way we pass from one to the other is the following. Uh, we, uh, we look at the normal flux on, uh, on our ball of radius R, which by the way has to be well chosen. Uh, so uh, so we, we, we kind of uh, uh, capture the flux there. We integrate it in time, that gives the F bar. Those are the Neumann data for, uh, for the Poisson equation. Then we take the gradient and we multiply it with the row and that's supposedly, or that's what the states is a good approximation to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the flux. So that's the, uh, so that's the kind of uh, more fluids type or Eulerian perspective on how to do this harmonic approximation. So, um, so what, I, what, I, what, I, what I want to do next is uh, I want to tell you how, uh, what, what we get from there. Hey, Felix, then, yeah? uh, could you please elaborate on the connection with the uh, uh, paper by Da Coronia and Moser? Oh, just, uh, just in the sense that uh, uh, there, I mean, there it's not about optimal transportation, but in a certain sense, it's about transportation. And so you want to kind of, uh, you want to connect one density to another density by flow. And, uh, and the, uh, the, how, how do you do that? You solve, uh, uh, you solve a Poisson problem and you, uh, you make such an ansatz to get kind of the, uh, to get a velocity. So that's the, that's the vague, it's more kind of, a, uh, uh, um, it's not a strict connection to da Coronia Moser. It's what just- is uh, What is the good R? The, okay, so this is, I mean, uh, I will perhaps get to, uh, to this a little bit later. Uh, so some people may know, I mean, there is this, uh, there is this, and that's actually what it comes closest to. There is this approach by, uh, by Simon and Schoen to the regularity of minimal surfaces, which is purely variational. And there also, you're, uh, when you compare with a harmonic graph, you have to do that on the right ball. I mean, in a certain sense, from all the balls of radius between one and two, you have to pick one where your flux boundary data are, let's say, not worse than average. And that's what I mean by the right ball. So it's potentially many choices of R? It's yeah, 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 yeah. So, so it's, I mean, right is, is the wrong word, good. So, so let's say there is, a, there, is a, there, there is a positive measure uh, of radii between zero, uh, between three and four, which would work. There are, just, uh, there are just many radii which happen to be, in a certain sense, bad because, uh, uh, because the flux boundary data, which you get from restricting your flux to the boundary, happens to be, let's say, below average. So I wouldn't say this is a, now this is more of a detail, but I can, perhaps it becomes clearer later on, depending on how much later on there is. But uh, but it's not uh, it's uh, it's not a it's not one good radius. It's just uh, uh, it's just uh, kind of a, a, um, a set of positive Lebesgue measure of good radii. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. I think you should carry on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Would you say so, something about the Dacronia Moser, uh, please? I'm sorry. The Dacronia Moser. Oh, this is. Yeah, I mean, uh, Camilo just asked the 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 question. So this is just a vague connection in the sense that they used. I mean, they were also ch kind of constructing uh, a push. I mean, a map by which you can push forward one density into the other density, and they also used the flow equation. They also solved the Poisson problem to do that. So it's okay. a very vague connection. I mean, just in the sense that here we, ha we make this connection to, uh, uh, to Poisson problem and there, the in inside there, there is also a connection with the Poisson problem. Again, this is not a big deal. If it's confusing, there's not much loss if you drop this line. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, so uh, so what's uh, what can be uh, what can be obtained from here? So uh, uh, we essentially recover uh, the result by De Filippis and Figali on the epsilon regularity. So in the sense I used it before, in the sense that uh, if our uh, local transportation distance and the uh, local size of the data in the sense of Hölder norms of the densities F and G fall below a certain threshold, uh, then we get C2 alpha regularity for the potential or C1 alpha regularity for the optimal map in form of the scale invariant uh, linear estimate. I have it on the next slide again, so uh, don't worry if uh, don't get afraid if I pass to the next slide because uh, I want to kind of contrast a little bit the differences in in the in the approach. So uh, so here again is the uh, uh, rough in kind of uh, in, in a brief notation the result uh, if the uh, local transportation cost plus the Hölder semi norms of the initial and the terminal density are small, then we get this uh, uh, estimate that the uh, uh, Hölder uh, half norm of the second derivatives of the Kantorovich potential are estimated in this way. So what's, what's in a certain sense the biggest difference between how they get the result and how we get the result? Um, they perturb around a nonlinear equation. So essentially they perturb around the Mont-Jean-Pierre equation with a constant right hand side, appealing to earlier work uh, uh, on the epsilon regularity for this equation, which is based on, on, on Caffarelli's theory. We right away perturb around the uh, Poisson operator. So in a certain sense, we perturb, we, 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 uh, we, we're, we're more st strongly linearizing which has so the to be clear Figali uh, is using the maximum principle in his book. Yes, okay. yes, and several. So he, I mean, he's using he's in particular using it uh, here in uh, in Figali and Kim, where he uses kind of refines where they refine Caffarelli's theory to get epsilon regularity for this kind of simple equation. But then also in going from the simple equation to uh, uh, kind of variable densities. Uh, there is yet, yet again a lot of use of regularity principle and no variational argument. Okay, thanks. So uh, uh, so the difference between uh, uh, between what we're doing here, the biggest difference is that uh, uh, that we work with competitors uh, and think of it as a strictly convex variation problem, and uh, they. Uh, their main motor is the comparison principle. But the advantage of kind of linearizing, of having, of perturbing around the linear problem is that uh, uh, we get estimates which right away look like as we, if we were dealing with a linear uh, equation. And also we get to C2 alpha in one step and uh, uh, don't need kind of uh, uh, a bootstrap argument uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the regularity. And um, so perhaps I'm going to do that only quickly. There are kind of new, I mean, we can derive new things like uh, a somewhat stricter boundary regularity and, uh, and also make, uh, uh, get new results on the matching problem. But uh, if you don't stop me, uh, and since it's on the slides, I just want to kind of mention this and whoever is interested in can look at the slides. But uh, instead, if, uh, if you don't mind, actually, how much time do I still have? 15 minutes, a, a bit more than 15 minutes, actually. Okay, then, then let me, rather than, than telling you about the applications, which I think are, are interesting, but uh, which uh, would open uh, kind of another box, let me tell you a bit more about the proof because this gives also gives me also a chance to make a kind of a closer connection to minimal surface theory. And uh, so I'll return to the, uh, to the harmonic approximation result. And, uh, and now I even make my life simpler 
and just uh, look at the situation where the uh, initial and the target density are locally constant. So in some ball B6, uh, so of course by scaling, I could replace B6 by any uh, radius, six by any radius, but uh, since we know how to do scaling, uh, let me uh, write it like this. Uh, so, uh, so now, now uh, the, the data term is gone and uh, uh, the only interesting quantity left uh, is the local energy, uh, which uh, here we look again at the Eulerian level. So the kinetic energy of the flux uh, density, uh, sorry, density flux pair and, uh, and, uh, and the, normal, um, uh, the normal flux uh, and the uh, time averaged normal flux. And, uh, and here, is, here is the statement in this situation. So there exists a good radius or there are many good radii uh, such that if we solve this um, uh, Neumann problem, and in this case, I don't need a constant here because F does have, F bar does have a uh, vanishing average, then uh, we, get this, uh, um, uh, we get this good control of the difference between the transport velocity, so the ratio between the flux and the density, and uh, the gradient of the harmonic function, in the sense that this quantity is estimated by a power larger than one of the um, original transport density. So now this, this, this result is perhaps in a certain sense more pleasing than the one before because there is no epsilon, no tau, um, uh, but uh, 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 but uh, but all the uh, all the interesting all the interest resides that uh, we can estimate a quantity that is of the type of an energy, just that it has the harmonic gradient inside by something that's a higher power of the energy. And of course, since we always think of small energy. Uh, uh, that's exactly what we want. We want to have a power that's larger than one and here one can be extremely explicit and uh, see that it's something that depends on the dimension. So that's in a certain sense the harmonic approximation lemma in its simplest version and that's how it was stated in the, in the, first, uh, in the first paper. And uh, now I want to uh, tell you kind of on two slides what the main ideas are to get this result. And then on one slide, I, I would like to tell you um, how, uh, how, how, how this is very, in many aspects, very analogous to, uh, 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 to uh, minimal surface, uh, to the approach in minimal surface theory. Okay, are there questions about this statement here? Now this is, I think, uh, even simpler to, uh, hopefully simpler to, uh, to absorb. So here again is the statement, there exists a harmonic uh, function phi so that uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this energetic difference between the uh, Eulerian velocity and a harmonic gradient is estimated by a high power of the uh, higher power larger than one uh, uh, of the energy. So I already told you uh, how to, uh, how to construct the phi by solving the, uh, uh, the Neumann problem. And, uh, um, um, and then we need, uh, we need something, uh, we need, and that's not surprising, if you want to work with a variational approach, you need some way to translate an energy gap into a distance. So if you have a, a quadratic variation problem, you know, leading to a linear equation, you know, Dirichlet equation, we know exactly that uh, if we have the minimizer and we have another test function, then the H1 difference between uh, uh, the solution and the test function is estimated, the squared H1 distance is estimated by the difference in energies. So that's in a certain sense, uh, in the quadratic case and in the strictly convex case, uh, uh, that's the same principle. And that's of course what drives this type of orthogonality drives the entire argument, that's crucial. And, uh, 
And here in this simple case, we can appeal to uh, McCann's displacement convexity to get this orthogonality in an extremely clean form. In the more general case, we have to kind of do it in a slightly different way, but in, the sim in this situation, we get this orthogonality in this very cute and nice form that the, uh, the quantity we want to estimate is just controlled by the difference between the nonlinear energy and in a certain sense, the linear energy, the Dirichlet integral. And, uh, and then it all uh, kind of uh, uh, reduces to constructing a competitor, a competitor that satisfies the same boundary conditions, a competitor for the Eulerian formulation of optimal transportation, so a rho tilde, a j tilde, uh, in such a way that its energy is not much above uh, the uh, uh, harmonic energy, the energy of the linearized problem, the Dirichlet energy of the harmonic function. And not much in the sense that we get this nonlinear uh, non -linear estimate. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's what it boils down to. One has to, uh, one has to connect the energy of the, harmonic, uh, uh, of the harmonic extension, Neumann extension, to uh, uh, one has to use the kind of harmonic Neumann extension to construct a competitor of the original problem so that its energy, the energy of the competitor, the nonlinear energy of the competitor is not much larger than the Dirichlet energy. So that's, that's really, that's, that's actually the, the, the kind of the most important step. And there is one slide uh, reminding you that essentially the only problem is a boundary layer. Uh, because uh, the boundary conditions which, uh, which come from, uh, from your optimal transportation problem, from the problem in the Eulerian perspective, is kind of a flux, I mean, sorry, a time-resolved boundary condition. It's an F which depends on T. Whereas if we take uh, the solution of the Neumann problem, that of course has F bar as boundary conditions. So we cannot just take... Uh, red phi as a competitor and constant density one. We have to kind of add to it a boundary layer construction, which accounts for the difference between the actual influx and the time averaged influx. And, uh, but that is clear that we should be able to do that in a small kind of, uh, in a small region near the boundary. So we want to kind of at the boundary layer construction, which we can estimate in a, in a good way. And uh, in, in the end, that's not so hard. It's in a certain sense, a low dimensional isoparametric inequality or estimate that allows you to do that, which is written down here, which, uh, which you don't have to, uh, which I don't expect uh, anybody to absorb, but just uh, it's one very explicit isoparametric estimate, which mixes spatial gradients and time gradients uh, that uh, that kind of is ultimately responsible for this uh, 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 power uh, that's strictly larger than one. So that's the that's the that's really the core of the idea. Get a do a boundary layer, and uh, uh, and now that kind of brings me almost to uh, uh, to the end because now I can kind of draw the analogies to uh, um, to what's done in minimal surfaces and. In a certain sense, it's closest to what uh, uh, um, um, uh, what we uh, found in um, uh, in the paper in an old paper by Schön and Simon, uh, which uh, kind of gives a kind of a completely variational uh, approach to uh, to the regularity of the minimal surface problem in the setting of uh, currents. And uh, so let me remind you kind of in, uh, in case of minimal surfaces, the main idea is to approximate a minimal surface by a harmonic graph. We are here approximating the displacement in optimal transformation by a harmonic gradient. So in both cases, there is harmonic, there is kind of approximation through a harmonic object. And, uh, and in both uh, approaches, what we use is only that the object, either the minimal surface or the, uh, uh, the optimal transportation rho j in the Eulerian formulation, 
that this object is minimizing its own boundary conditions. I mean, minimizing under its own boundary conditions. So if you want minimizing under compact perturbations. So both approaches, at least Schoen Simon and ours, uh, never use the Euler Lagrange equation, the first variation of the problem. And uh, if, you, uh, if you do this, uh, both approaches run into, I mean, in both approaches, you have a mismatch of the type of boundary conditions when you kind of paste in the harmonic construction. In case of, uh, in case of minimal surfaces, that comes from the fact that you don't know a priori that your minimal surface is locally a graph. So you have to kind of paste in some vertical parts and that costs. And in our case, uh, it's very similar and I just showed it. Uh, you have to kind of uh, make the connection between the time averaged flux boundary conditions, which you have on the side of the harmonic radiant and the time resolved boundary conditions, which you need on the level of optimum transportation. And in fact, in both cases, there are lower dimensional isothermetric estimates. And in both cases, you, in order to use them, you have to choose a good radius in, in order to show that this, uh, this error, which comes from the mismatch of the type of boundary conditions is of higher order, comes with this dimensional exponents that, that's strictly larger than one. And then of course, in both cases, you have to somehow appeal to the strict convexity of your problem to convert the energy gap into a, a statement on the distance. So, uh, so there is a, there is a, a kind of a, uh, 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 a lot of uh, uh, analogy, and I'm grateful to Jonas Hirsch who pointed out this uh, uh, this paper to us. Okay, so um, um, now I'm uh, almost done. How, what, how sh should I stop now, or Camilo? Well, I think you can still go for five minutes. Okay, so uh, so then uh, I mean once you have this uh, this harmonic approximation result, then there is a machinery uh, which leads you from this lemma one to theorem one, which was the epsilon regularity. Uh, you use you use I mean the main idea of course is now no matter whether you're in minimal surfaces or in optimum transportation, you borrow the regularity from your. Uh, from your harmonic, uh, the well-known regularity for harmonic functions, you transmit it. Uh, uh, you transmit it uh, uh, to uh, um, uh, to the uh, to the object you're interested in. Uh, we go back to the Lagrangian uh, that tells us that uh, um, uh, we can find, in a certain sense, now an affine change of variables, which comes from the first and second gradients, first and second derivatives of the harmonic function under which the energy has become smaller. So there is, a, uh, there is a transformation Q and a shift vector B, uh, so that if we monitor this kind of beefed up uh, transportation distance here, we get a kind of a decrease of, uh, um, of, the, uh, of the energy by a definite fraction uh, if we go to a smaller, uh, if we go to a smaller ball and uh, that, uh, uh, um, uh, um, but then this is, uh, 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 there is an error term, but that's uh, uh, of higher order because the exponent is larger than one. And, uh, and of course, very much like Caffarelli uses uh, or uh, use a kind of uh, uh, affine invariance of the mange pair equation, we have to use affine invariance of optimal transportation. And uh, so that these types of affine changes variables don't matter. And then you can start based on such an inequality, you can start a Campanato iteration. You're using uh, the uh, Campanato characterization of Hölder spaces to get the uh, Schauder type result, which I mentioned in the beginning. And uh, okay, so when one's dealing with rough fluxes, there are some twists you have to do. You have to regularize a bit uh, you can use optimal transportation to do that. I'm skipping over this. And uh, let me just uh, kind of come to the summary. So, uh, uh, so the, the main purpose was to make the point that interestingly, uh, 
uh, at least I find it interesting that, that you can develop a regularity theory for optimal transportation and therefore for the Mange Ampere equation that is very much in parallel to what's classically known for minimal surface theory, uh, where the key step is the harmonic approximation, where there are even there are many similarities. Um, okay, so far uh, we recovered some results, uh, we improved some results slightly, but then I think uh, this theory is much more flexible to deal with very rough data, so very rough measures, uh, as I stated in the first proposition, so therefore we can make more substantial progress in this uh, optimal matching problem, which is quite popular right now. And uh, one thing we're, we're, we're about to finish uh, with um, a PhD student, Maxime Prodome, and a postdoc, Tobias Reed, is that like uh, um, De Filippis and Figali, uh, we can uh, also deal with more general cost functionals where uh, the main idea is, our main idea is uh, that we use the concept of quasi-minimality, which is also kind of uh, a very useful concept in the minimal surface theory if you want to do, if you want to kind of develop a regularity theory which also holds for perturbations, one can do that the same thing here, same, same way here. Uh, in a certain sense, we use that uh, 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 something that solves the optimal transport problem for non-quadratic cost, but that's close to quadratic, is an almost minimizer of a problem that solves the, of, of, uh, of the quadratic problem. And then that perfectly feeds into, uh, into this variational regularity theory with, without much uh, further effort. Okay, so let me stop here. Okay, uh, I'm taking over from Camilo at this last second. Uh, thank you for a beautiful lecture, uh, very clear. Great to uh, start our Zoom seminars in this way. I saw there were uh, well over 100 participants. So that's great. I'll uh, let Sylvia at the end unmute everybody for clapping at the end. But I think uh, if I <laughs> maybe I can uh, uh, encourage people to ask questions, uh, why don't you just unmute yourself and ask a question first so that we have time here. Um, uh, Otto took exactly one hour, but nobody's rushing anywhere. Any questions, anybody? Uh, you can also put it on chat, and I'm sure Sylvia can control all of us if anybody's out of out of line. Uh, okay, I'll have a, I have a question. So uh, this is a beautiful treatment. You mentioned Shane and Simon. Yes. In their approach in minimal surfaces, what did their different approach uh, lead to? Maybe that gives some hints as to where you're going. You indicated where you're going in your next steps, but was their method then used without going to the Euler-Lagrange equation, their method? Why did they develop it in that context, you know? That's a, that's a, so, I mean, I mean, they, they, I mean, in the end, what they proved is also an epsilon regularity result. Uh, I think they were looking at pretty, so I think one reason for doing it there is that they looked at pretty general integrants. So not just isotropic, not necessarily isotropic in integrants at the time. And I think at the time that probably wasn't so clear how to, how to deal with this. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, uh, I can't give a better answer than this, that they also, I mean, also did, uh, I mean, the final result is epsilon regularity, but they were treating kind of a generalization of the minimal surface equation where, um, uh, where they had more general integrants and, and isotropic you, integrants. So in sorry. your setting, so in your setting, in your setting, are there yeah. some, uh, I, I don't know the subject, so are there some obvious cases where the maximum principle is not available and where your method is going to work. I, I, I'm sure that's what you so, aiming at. So, so, so right. So, so I, th I think um, the maximum principle, um, so that's, that's in a certain sense related to this optimal matching problem where 
kind of at least one of these two measures is very irregular. And uh, in this case, uh, um, the maximal principle wouldn't lead you far because there is something which is called kind of Alexandrov comparison principle, which is at the core kind of the zeroth step of the maximum based uh, uh, regularity theory for the mont pair equation. And that always requires a right-hand side that's in a certain sense bounded away from zero and infinity. And uh, now here we have a right-hand side that's a measure. So that's neither bounded away from zero to infinity. So there wouldn't be a way, uh, at least as far as can see, to even get uh, kind of a maximum based uh, approach started because that would have to start, that would have to deal with kind of a, uh, uh, solutions which a priori already have a higher regularity because the right hand side is nicer than just a measure. So I would say so far that's the strongest case for uh, for uh, for going for doing this uh, in, in in this variational thing. Uh, looks very convincing to me. Uh, so uh, let me reach out to anybody else who's watching here. Any other questions? Okay, I have a question actually. Yeah, go ahead. All right, all right thanks, uh, Felix, for the very nice talk. Uh, so basically, my, my question is, uh, can this method actually work in some uh, low regularity regime? So sometimes, you know, when, when the density have problems or when the boundary are not so regular, I mean, we don't expect actually C2 alpha for the solution. So when the optimal regularity is, say, C1 alpha, the best, can we still use this method to get some progress? So this is you, um, uh, you yeah, right? This is me. Yeah, this, this is me. <laughs> Um, that's, uh, so we didn't, uh, uh, we didn't look into this. Uh, it's, I would say in principle, it's conceivable because, uh, the, when, I mean, here for this uh, matching problem, we're actually looking rather at a large scale regularity, not a small scale regularity. Uh, and I'm saying that because in this case, it's also not so much, a a C2 alpha, but more kind of a large scale uh, C1 alpha or kind of a different scaling. So I, 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 don't, think, I don't think that this, uh, this approach is, uh, is limited to, uh, 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 to an outcome that comes in form of, the, of a C2 alpha. I mean, if I go back to, uh, for a second to the, uh, to the main, to kind of the key technical result, which is this proposition one, which is just this harmonic approximation. Um, uh, there is nothing which, uh, which tells you, you have, to, you have to use it for C2 alpha. But, uh, but that's, that's the long answer. The, the, short, the, the short and honest answer is probably, it has to be explored. I see, thanks, thanks. Okay. Uh, I got a question in, in chat. So Jean-Pierre Magnon asked, uh, is there a control on the dependence on mu, variation on the initial mu, regularity of variations? Uh, can you? So the question is whether there is a control on how, on the dependence of mu. So like how do the variation on the initial, uh, on the initial mu, uh, affects, I guess, the regularity of... Okay. I mean, that's perhaps best seen. Let's see. Um, I mean, here, here, that's the, uh, that's kind of, uh, one version of writing the epsilon, at least the way we get it, uh, the epsilon regularity result, which is kind of, in a certain sense, very Definite, and but I don't know what this was the question. So here is the uh, here is the solution of the uh, optimal. I mean the op kind of the Monge Kantorovich potential, uh, the uh, the Hurdai C minor norm of the second derivatives, and here is the uh, the density of the initial measure uh, 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 mu and the density g of the target measure mu and. Uh, so in that sense, uh, this estimate is very explicit. 
but I don't know whether that was really the question. They say thanks a lot, so I guess so. <laughs> and there is another question. I'm not sure why I, I think, but anyway, from Gan to Moore, and then I'm not gonna try to pronounce the, the last name. I'm sorry. Uh, the, and someone they say it's a naive question. Uh, is there an approach analogous to Campanato iteration to deal with the LP theory of regularity? Um, with the, the, the question read LP theory? Or? Yeah, yeah. So the, whether the, there is an approach which is analogous to the Campanado iteration and it deals with the LP theory of regularity. So LP theory meaning like Calderon Zugmund theory. Uh, Let's see. That, that doesn't, that, I, I, I mean, if that's the question, whether kind of uh, uh, LP theory means Calderon Zugmund theory, that typically. I mean, that can also be kind of done in a very uh, uh, elegant uh, uh, and uh, soft mm -hmm. uh, and energy-based way, uh, but it doesn't, strictly speaking, does not use a Campanato iteration. They do mean calderon Zygmunt, by the way. Sorry? Ca they do mean calderon Zygmunt, yeah. yeah. So, so that's, that's typically, I mean, uh, I mean, there are, I mean, modern, modern kind of kernel free approaches to Calderon Zygmunt theory by uh, Caffarelli Peral, by Shen. Uh, so that, I mean, there are such, uh, uh, such estimates, I mean, such approaches to Calderon Zygmunt theory, which just work with energetic quantities. Uh, but, um, I wouldn't call them Campanato iteration. And now if the additional question is whether that can be used here, probably that's also the answer, the honest answer would be, it's, one should explore it, I don't know. All right, uh, so if, uh, if that's more or less all the questions, let's I'm thank everybody so make sure that it's not not in nobody screaming in your background yeah also also you know people can send me an email yeah uh, uh, so that's a good idea uh, and uh, all right if we all unmuted unmute us all please Sylvia. Give the clap.